Welcome to the Midlife Muscle Hormone Mastery Method. Um, this is something that I've been working really hard at for the last five years. Um, you've probably all followed me for a very long time. Um, maybe maybe not everyone followed me for a long time, but you kind of know what I'm all about. Maybe you came across one of my reels on Instagram. Um, but you, today you're going to learn a little bit about this method and a little bit more about me. That way you feel connected to what I'm saying and also so that you know why you should be listening to me. Because obviously this is kind of unconventional. Like I'm not a woman, so talking about women's hormones can kind of be like, one, like kind of attention grabbing, but two, like a little controversial. Before we do that, I know you guys probably want to figure out what you're going to be learning first today. So first, we're going to be talking about how to effectively manage your stress and cortisol, because that's something that I heard a lot of people very interested in wanting to learn about tonight. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how to build back muscle and tighten up or tone up, just because I know that a lot of you maybe have had kids. You feel like you have a little bit more loose skin, and that's something that you want to be able to figure out how you can you know, solve by building back muscle. You want to be able to eliminate, you know, your sugar cravings and then also in turn be able to feel more energized because you have more stable blood sugar. You want to naturally find balance with your hormones so that you can feel more like yourself because your hormones really are you. They make you who you are. Without them, you don't feel your best. Um, we're going to be talking about restorative sleep, how to improve your mood and energy through some sleep, you know, sleep hygiene uh, strategies. And then I just want to help you feel more educated so that you can advocate for your own health as well. That's what I'm most passionate about. And that's what I ultimately want you to get out of this is that you can advocate for your own health and feel very confident in it. A couple different topics. We're going to go over the menstrual cycle and the importance of hormones. I think it's important that I go over today's hormones because if you don't feel comfortable with me talking about some of these things, then at least you know to leave now and then you're good. But so we'll be talking about the menstrual cycle, the importance of hormones, cycle tracking, and the four-step process on how to do that. And then we're going to be talking about adrenal health and how to support your cortisol and stress to support your adrenals. We're going to be talking about stress management techniques to help support your adrenal uh, glands. And then we're going to be talking about the high, the hormone hierarchy, which is, you know, pretty much how we start focusing on solving your hormone imbalances. We'll be talking about the key hormones, estradiol, progesterone, DHEA, T, uh, DHT, testosterone, and all the other fun stuff. Uh, we're going to be talking about balancing blood sugar, macronutrients, and hormones, and then optimizing your gut health, liver, and thyroid. And hopefully we'll have enough time to get into the lab values as well. Here on the left side, I was super shy. Uh, I didn't really have a father growing up. My parents split up. My dad was from the Dominican Republic. My mom was here from uh, Canada. So um, my dad was a musician, always out playing playing with his band. I never got to see him. So um, my mother and father split up when I was really young. And I feel like that made me a little bit more like of an attention seeker. So I, I was a people pleaser growing up. Started hanging around the wrong people at a very young age. Loved sports, loved music. I actually taught myself, fun fact, how to play guitar at the age of six. I just really wanted to make my mom proud and like show her that she was doing like a really good job raising me and that like I was special or something. So I just, I got really good at the guitar. Um, and everybody always asked me to like play music by the fire. And Marissa and I, my partner, she's here with me right now. She, her and I play together all the time. Still to this day, I love music. Um, but more than anything, growing up, I spent a lot of time with my mom because my dad wasn't really around. So I'm kind of a mama's boy in that way. But talking about my mom, here's my mom right here. Beautiful woman. Um, worked so hard. And uh, I started working out because I wanted to protect my mom. Because years after my actual like dad and mom split up, my mom met someone else. And he was a narcissist. And, um, you know, he there was a lot of domestic violence growing up. So I felt this like deep rooted anger. Um, and I decided to use the gym as an outlet. And so I started going to the gym and working out and uh, it came in handy like in the end of high school because I really had to step in a few times to, to again, protect my mom. And that's kind of why I started working out, which kind of sucks because, you know, we should all be working on ourselves because we love ourselves, not because we hate ourselves. And the truth is, I didn't like how frail and skinny and weak I felt. And one of the biggest reasons why I love doing what I do is I want women to feel strong. I want women to feel capable. I want women to feel like they understand their body and that they're working on themselves because they love themselves, not because they hate themselves the way that I used to, because I remember that pain. And I just don't want you to have to feel that way. I played elite level basketball as well in high school and uh, traveled to the States for a couple summers playing. And uh, my mom was always my biggest cheerleader. So she was always there supporting me. Now, after high school, I had to get away from all of the negativity. So I graduated college, moved to China, taught children English through my passion of fitness. And it was just like, it was really fun, interactive. The kids loved it. Um, then I realized, okay, I'm not really doing this much for myself anymore. I was trying to get away from all of the the the, the trauma, all of the negativity. Um, and I realized that I was just getting more and more and more depressed. So I found God at that moment, which in China, they don't really sell Bibles. They don't really believe in that stuff. So I had to download a VPN, get it on my phone, start doing that kind of stuff. And, um, and honestly, because of that, I found that I needed to listen to my gut. And through prayer, I came back to Canada, started working on my health and fitness 
started getting out of depression and anxiety and 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 I started building my business. During COVID, I met my, like my partner, my now partner Marissa, love her to death. Um and she really lifted me up and she saw what what I was capable of when I couldn't see it for myself and that really boosted my business and then that takes me to today. I'm living on an oceanfront on um, horrible camera. Oceanfront um cabin on Vancouver Island with my dog Gypsy with Marissa and we have a sprinter van and we surf a lot. So that's what we do now. Today, I'm going to come back to this uh, at the end as well, but this is the hormone hierarchy. So when we think about balancing our horm hormones, we want to think of it as a pyramid with the adrenal health and insulin and blood sugar as the foundation. And then the next level of the pyramid is your thyroid hormones and then your sex hormones. And that would be all at the top. So a lot of people, though, they start at the very top. They immediately think that, you know, uh, exercise and also taking hormone therapy, like taking estrogen, progesterone, taking these endogenous hormones themselves will actually fix some of the struggles that they're dealing with, which we'll get into in a second, whether that be, you know, having trouble falling asleep, anxiety, high blood pressure, you know, fatigue, moodiness, poor memory, all that stuff, like low sex drive. Like we just think that going right for the hormones and blaming it on estrogen and progesterone and our lot, the loss of our period or our irregular cycles are to blame, but in actuality, we always want to be focusing on stress, which is cortisol. We want to be focusing on insulin and our blood sugar to manage our food cravings and our energy throughout the day, if I didn't already say that. Oxytocin is on here as well, which is that love hormone that we don't get when we are putting ourselves into social isolation. So I want to get you guys involved here a little bit. In the comment section, type in a one if you feel like you have a really good social life and you know you're socializing right now and you feel like you belong when you go out and you, yeah, just type in a one if you feel like that's you. And I don't need to go into the chat right now. I don't want to jump in and out, but more women than not are very stuck in social isolation because they don't feel like they belong because they don't like the changes that their body's going through. And for that reason, they lack a lot of oxytocin, which is the hormone that makes you love yourself more and feel loving towards everyone else. And so we want to focus on that base pyramid first before immediately blaming testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, and those sex hormones that make such a big difference. Because even if you were to take those hormones, but you weren't focusing on blood sugar, your insulin levels, and everything in between, you'd still feel like crap. And you'd likely still struggle with your weight because you're not focusing on your, you know, your, your cravings, your energy levels throughout the day. And everything in between like you can still have poor blood sugar and high cortisol levels and low oxytocin when still taking testosterone estrogen progesterone and with those things being out of whack the oxytocin insulin blood sugar and cortisol with those things being out of whack your adrenal glands not functioning properly then everything else is out of whack anyways okay um cool so that's pretty much it for this one a uh, couple different reasons why you may have hormonal imbalances is because of the different phases of life. So it could be, for one, it's like puberty, right? So if you have kids, you'll see the changes there with their mood and their energy, et cetera. Then there's, you know, you're through pregnancy. Then there's perimenopause. Then there's menopause. And like, you know, that's postmenopause and menopause are on the same page. And so those make a difference with your hormone, imba hormone imbalances. We have chronic stress, toxin exposure. So if you like, you know, if you're exposing yourself to like bleach and other chemicals that aren't natural, we want to go for more like, cleaning products that are more green that use natural stuff in it because those toxins can have an effect on how your estrogen levels are which in short all right a lot of you guys might not know this but we have things uh inside of for example the toxic products that aren't natural have certain estrogens in them that mock what we would actually have in our body so they block those receptors so when estrogen is going through our body and it's trying to get onto the receptors on every pretty much every organ in our body has estrogen receptors so when you have all these toxins these xenoestrogens lock onto those receptors and then actual estrogen can't get in there so now all of a sudden we have this excess amount of estrogen hanging around and too much estrogen isn't good that's the whole point of hormone balance we want to have a balance of all hormones and they're always going to be fluctuating, but, you know, we don't want them to be so high or so low. And so when you have so many toxins in your environment, then, it, you know, your estrogen levels just get way too high in comparison to your progesterone. And that's when you start feeling really shitty. So toxin exposure, nutritional deficiency. So if you've done low calorie diets for a very long time or you're always cutting out carbs, uh, trauma, tumors to the endocrine gland, like that's going to make an effect because you'll probably have to do like some sort of radiation or take some medication. And then also autoimmune conditions, which we will get into. And as you can see, it says type 1 diabetes, like type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, 
these things we can manage through our blood sugar. So if that's not being addressed first, then we're going to have hormonal imbalances over time. Not immediate, but over time. Um, so if you guys want to take a screenshot of this, I think I've already kind of went over some of the, you know, symptoms are. So you guys can take a look at that. Maybe some of them resonate with you. Maybe some of them don't. Everybody has a very different experience going through perimenopause and menopause itself, um, which we will kind of define shortly here, like what they actually are. But I do want to like, I do really want to make a point that hormones matter because some people, like as much as I'm trying to say that, like you need to focus on blood sugar and your insulin levels and, you know, your stress and then your thyroid hormones, and then you focus on your sex hormones. Like, I'm not trying to dismiss that your hormones are like not important. I'm not trying to say that they're very important, but we do want to focus on like the basic lifestyle boxes first so that we can take like, it's no, it's no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's no, uh, no, it's like, it's like people don't magically have balanced hormones just because it doesn't just happen. They have really good behaviors, whether it be stress management, so they can cope really well. You know, it, there's a lot of studies to prove that women who have gone through domestic violence end up going through menopause much er, at a much earlier age because of their chronic stress all the time. Like, so if maybe you don't have great coping mechanisms and you are falling through stress and that's the way that you cope is eating your feelings and your blood sugars all over the place, like it's, it's going to affect you. So anyways, why hormones matter? Very simple. Okay. Hormones are just the chemical, you know, messengers that tell our body what it should or shouldn't be doing, but they're more than that. They're orchestrators of our body's most vital processes. So when they're in tune, we feel energized, clear-headed, and strong. But when they're out of whack, they can literally affect everything from our mood to our sleep, to our weight, to our overall health. And I know that you guys know that because you're feeling it. If you didn't, you wouldn't be here right now. So, but I want to go over some common misunderstandings of menopause and perimenopause and the any transition that you're going through life right now, whether it be you trying to become fertile and maybe you have PCOS and you're feeling some changes, but peri-postmenopause is the end. It's not. That's what the biggest misconception is, is that it's the end. But to me, it's only the beginning. And I say this because many women fear that hormonal changes mean that they're A, broken, or B, less desirable. But our hormones are constantly changing and fluctuating all the time. They will never truly be in balance. We just don't want them to be like way out of whack. We don't want too much or too little of anything. We just want to have more optimal optimal levels. However, they're always balancing themselves out. Okay. Um, because they've always been fluctuating, I think that the best mindset that we can have is that uh, we have to focus on them really closely because now more than ever, you can't get away with ignoring them the way that you used to. So in your 20s and 30s, you don't really pay attention to your hormones. They're thriving. Well, now all of a sudden for the first time in your life, now you're focusing on your hormones more than ever because you, you, you're being forced to. And I think that's a really good thing. You know why? Because in a stage of life, who resonates with this? In a stage of life that you're going through where people would think that life would slow down in midlife or in your 40s or even in your late 30s, if you're experiencing some change, people would think that life is now slowing down. It's not. It's speeding up. And now more than ever, you deserve to tune into your body, to take care of yourself because you've been taking care of everyone else your whole life. You've been taking care of everyone else your whole life. And now your body and the hormones that are changing are simply just trying to tell you like, hey, we can't ignore ourselves anymore. We can't, we can't put ourselves in the back burner anymore. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as you and your body telling you, we need to pay more attention to ourselves. So now that we have that kind of mindset shift, I also like uh, want to address the fact that at 25, all of us stop producing the levels of DHT that are necessary to continue to develop our reproductive organs or support hair and nails and skin. So all of us have experienced to a degree, like a lack of production of a hormone. And this is like no different. Obviously, you're just having a lot heavier negative symptoms, which I want to help you be able to like overcome, which is what this training is all about. And you a thousand percent will get a lot more out of this than you would have anticipated, like you would have initially anticipated, because that's why I created this. I want you guys to know exactly what you can do to address some of the symptoms that I'll be talking about here today. Okay, lastly, um, yes, menopause is normal, but suffering isn't necessary. So a lot of people will hear from their doctors like, oh, you're just going through menopause, it's a normal part of life, like you're gonna have to suck it up, right? But it's also like now we have bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, which is exactly identical to the exact same hormones that we produce in our body versus in the past you would take like synthetic hormones and those have much higher side effects which a lot of people were scared of initially as like cancer and stuff like that but as studies have come out over the years a lot of doctors are overworked they don't go and 
do continued education because there's not enough doctors and everybody who works in that medical field as a OBGYN or a general practitioner, they're just too burnt out to do continued ed education in menopause care. And a fact is that only four to 8% of general practitioners feel comfortable managing menopause with their clients, with their, with their patients. It's a very small percentage. And so in residency, OBGYN and general practitioners only get four hours of menopause care training. Big problem because all of you are going to go through menopause, yet most doctors have no idea what to do except to prescribe you an antidepressant, right? Especially because the symptoms that you bring them are maybe depressive or like anxiety, like you have depression, anxiety, joint pain, aches, poor sleep. like, And so like all of these end up coming back to like either an anxiety or a depression medication. And that's like doctors can be... Uh, financially motivated to give you medication to fix your problems it just they make more money if they prescribe more medication so you are likely overlooked because you are the demographic that isn't spending the most money for fertility like women who are trying to become pregnant or women who who are going through puberty and because they're children we got to pay attention to children but as soon as you hit 45 50 you're neglected that's why i'm standing up here on a 5 p.m. for me on the PS on the West Coast and you guys are on the East Coast. Like that's why right now I'm sitting here talking to you because I want to advocate for you because I know what's right because I want to do what's right. And I know that you do too. So the average age for menopause is between 45 and 55. That means that you've gone 12 months without having your period. That's what marks the day that you are postmenopausal. You're postmenopausal once 12 months have come together and you still haven't had your cycle. Perimenopause is average age is like 38. And if you're like 35 and you're thinking, haha, this doesn't apply to me, then don't wait. Because if you can start getting ahead of these symptoms, then you won't have such a hard experience with it. People wait and wait and wait and wait. And they're like, oh, this doesn't apply to me. Like I'm young forever. And then all of a sudden it just hits you like a train. It's much easier to prevent than it is to like deal with it when it comes up. Right. Cool. So really quick, just some of the endocrine um, system at a glance. That way, you know, like what organs are responsible for what really quickly. So we have the adrenal glands. OK, these are above the kidneys and um, its function is on stress response. It's a part of the HPA axis, which is your hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. It, they all work together. So your brain tells your body, oh, okay, we're we're stressed out here. And then your adrenals release, you know, things such as cortisol, which is the hormone that is stress, right? Uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, which is that fight or flight, aldosterone, which supports your blood pressure. Um, Marissa, can, uh, can I charge my laptop? Maybe there's like an extension cord somewhere. I'm at 10%. Um, and like very small amounts of sex hormones as well. Okay. Then we have the hypothalamus, which is in your brain. I already spoke about it. But that uh, is responsible for uh, oxytocin, dopamine, vasopressin, and a bunch of all, all these other ones up here. Okay, The ovaries, you guys already know what that's all about, but essentially that's where the majority of the hormones that are produced are estrogen and progesterone. Okay, um, Then we have your pancreas, and that controls your blood sugar levels, which would be both your insulin and your, you know, your glucagon, which is, supports your blood sugar. We have your parathyroid glands, um, which what's up? Then we have your parathyroid glands, which is uh, controlling your blood cal calcium levels, your bone health, etc. Then we have your penile gland, which is in your brain, your pituitary gland, um, and then your thyroid, thymus, and testes. So these are what make up your endo the endocrine system. They're all working together to balance your hormones. And I think it's really important for you to be able to see all this and screenshot it so that you know what each is responsible for. So that when you're, you know, when you are trying to become more aware of how everything works together, you can connect the dots. This is not working. Okay. I'm just going to sit maybe over here and then plug it into there. Cool. Hold on. I'm moving myself over here so that my laptop can plug in and we can continue this training. All right. Hopefully you guys are sticking with me. You guys are getting value so far. Um, next thing is this, I want, I want you guys to, this is the boring stuff, but I really want to like break down the basics because I know that you guys are eager to learn about everything, but I want you guys, everything to click at the end and be like, wow, this all made sense. And I'm glad that I learned the basics first. So here are the key players in your hormones right now and what they do. So we have estrogen, which is 
plays a very important role in menstruation, pregnancy, menopause, and the development of like other reproductive form of uh, tissues. It's found in nearly literally every tissue in the body. Uh, and it affects your urinary tract, your heart, your bones, your brain, your skin, your hair, your mucous membrane. So if right now you're noticing that like your ears are itchy, your eyes are itchy, stuff like that. It's because it does affect your mucus and, and how hydrated you are. It also affects your pelvic muscles. So you, know, you might have more pelvic floor pain because um, your estrogen levels are changing. Let me just make sure. Perfect. Okay. And then we have DHEA. So dehydroepiendosterone is an androgen produced by the ovaries or testes from cholesterol and in the adrenal cortex. So DHE production peaks around the age of 25, and then it begins to decline. So this hormone is important to maintain cognitive function, mood, and bone health. We have progesterone, which is one of the most important hormones. That's kind of like the calming hormone. But it's made by the corpus luteum in the ovaries and by the placenta during pregnancy. It's also produced in the testes and can be produced in the adrenal glands. Progesterone's primary function is to stimulate the thickening of the uterine lining and prepare for implantation of a fertilized egg. So progesterone also plays an important role in mood and thyroid health and keeping estrogen levels in balance. So they kind of estrogen and progesterone work together. Then we have de dehydrotestosterone, which is DHT. Um, so I meant to say DHEA here. I don't know if I said DHT before. But dehydrotestosterone is an androgen made by testosterone in various body tissues with the help of an enzyme known as 5-alpha reductase. It's a super key player in puberty, genital tissue development, and fetal development, and it supports healthy hair growth. Then we have testosterone, which for whatever reason, I mean, I can understand like women are afraid of testosterone. Like anything that has testosterone, we got to stay away from. Like we don't want to look like a man, but testosterone is very important. Testosterone belongs to a group of hormones known as androgens, just like DHT, and it's present in both men and female. It's just that men make about 25 to or sorry, 20 to 25 percent higher levels of testosterone than females, which honestly like isn't that much more than you would think. You think it's a lot more, right? So testosterone is produced by the ovaries and the adrenal glands, and they play a super important role in bone density. So if you like after 50, I believe that your risk for breaking or fracturing a bone in your risk increases by 50 percent. So it's such a large percentage. So we want to be able to maintain as much testosterone as we can to prevent that. I can't count the amount of times I'm speaking to women on Facebook who are interested in the program and they're like, I'm so afraid of breaking my bones if I lift weights because last year I like broke my hip or this and that. And they're like 50, 60, right? So like, it's very important to your longevity. Having enough testosterone is very important. Um, I always struggle to say this one. Androstenidine. Androstenidine is an androgen produced by the ovaries or testes. Obviously, we keep talking about ovaries. Like this isn't, we're not talking about men here uh it plays a key role in the production of estrogen and testosterone it's been marketed in supplement form but here's the problem is that it claims that it's going to help boost your testosterone levels and strength but it's been banned because it has a lot of serious health side effects like blood clotting and stuff like that so if you see supplements out there with this name right on it like stay as far away as you can from it cool so let's quickly like identify what perimenopause is how to track your cycle okay uh like what that looks like and then also post-menopause. So perimenopause, the definition is a transitional phase leading up to menopause. So it takes time. Typically like from 45, sorry, from 38 to like 43 is where we see that transitional phase. Um, it says typically women in their forties, but the majority of women that I speak to nowadays with all the stress happening, COVID, all these things, like women are getting it in their late thirties, super common, it's super common. But, um, Essentially, the ovaries gradually produce less estrogen, leading to fluctuations in hormone levels. So that means that you have more progesterone than estrogen, or even vice versa. So symptoms can be that women may experience irregular menstrual cycles, so heavier or lighter periods, hot flashes, sleep disturbances, mood swings, and some other you know hormonal changes. There's so many. Um, perimenopause lasts until menopause, the point when the ovaries stop releasing eggs altogether. So you're no longer like you know you can no longer have babies anymore. So your menstrual cycle, let's talk about that before we dive into what menopause is. Okay. We have four phases. I've simplified it this way. So you guys can see it here. We have the follicular phase, which is going from day one to day 14. So I, I, before I jump into this, I actually think it's really important to explain why I'm ta talking to you guys about your period, because if you don't fully understand the cycle and you still have like, I, I feel like across the board, when we hear the word period, a lot of people think gross we don't want it. Men are lucky. 
But unless you understand how you can read your cycle and what it does for you, like you, you can't really appreciate it. And like, for me, it's hard for me to check my hormone levels unless I get blood work, but you guys can actually see a lot of what's happening underneath the hood with your body simply by understanding your cycle. So if you are having hormone fluctuations, you can actually figure out where without needing blood work by understanding this stuff. So the follicular phase literally just starts on day one of your period. So, well, that's your menstrual phase. And then your body releases FSH, which is follicular stimulating hormone or follicle stimulating hormone. And then that allows the ovaries to produce follicles. And then what happens is one follicle matures into an egg. And then what happens at that point is that estrogen levels rise and that starts to thicken the uterine lining. And uh, this is when going through the ovulation phase, we see progesterone start to increase. And then essentially that mature egg is released from the ovaries. And then uh, luteinizing hormone surges. And then that's when the corpus luteum, which produces uh, progesterone, is released. And uh, progesterone prepares the uterus for potential pregnancy. Uh, if pregnancy doesn't occur, then progesterone and estrogen levels drop, leading to menstruation. And then that's kind of like where the uterine lining just sheds, resulting in your period. And then the cycle just restarts over again. So in perimenopause, your cycle becomes irregular due to these fluctuations in estrogen and progesterone. Some of the symptoms that are uncommon that m might resonate with you would be poor oral health. So it's really hard to like keep your oral health up to date to keep it clean. Uh, itchy eyes and ears, frozen shoulders. So a lot of joint pain is particularly in your shoulders is where we see this. Um, mood swings, poor sleep, lack of motivation, increased food allergies, itchy skin, tingling hands and feet, an electric sh shock sensation from head to toe. And this typically happens from like low estrogen and then burning mouth. So sometimes you might feel like some burning mouth sensations. Cool. So now we're going to talk about actually tracking your cycle. So if you guys have a pen and paper, I highly recommend this because this is what all of you guys should do if you are still having your cycle right now. If, if you're not having your cycle, I still think it's important to like be able to share this information with your loved ones and stuff like that. But essentially, the very first step to tracking your menstrual cycle is checking your cervical fluid. So this is going to be the clue to actually what's happening in each stage of your menstrual cycle, because it's, it's going to change with each stage. Typically, it's going to start out like dry, sticky, following a period. Then it's going to be a little bit more creamy of a consistency. And then as ovulation approaches, it's going to get wetter and it's going to take on a little bit more of like a vicious raw egg white consistency. And then after ovulation, the cervical fluid becomes stickier and then dry for the remainder of the luteal phase, which is that last phase of your cycle. So follicular first, luteal last. So in that last then it's going to be like that. But um, for those of you that are like, let's just say you're trying to get more uh, you know, fertile, you want to have a baby. It's a cool little fact I want to share with you all today. A lot of studies have found that bacterial vaginosis increases the chances of a miscarriage in the second trim trimester, which is one of the reasons why charting cervical fluid is super crucial, especially for women who are conceiving or pregnant. So because like if we can keep track of our cervical fluid, we can understand what is going on based on the color and the fluidity of it, the consistency. Something very important to keep track of. And a, and a really big hack is to wear like dark underwear so that you're able to like see. Okay, so you're able to see what is happening. Um, yeah, cool. Next thing. So step two is checking your basal body temperature. And this is a fun fact. Taking your basal body temperature can determine whether or not you actually have a thyroid deficiency, whether you're pregnant, and some hormonal status that you'd otherwise pay, like only pay um, attention to or check if you got blood work done. Some people like get blood work to try to figure these things out. But what I'm going to teach you right now is going to help you be able to actually, you know, uh, see it yourself at home. So a couple other examples, uh, if you see a significant rise in your body temperature, which we'll kind of get into in a minute here, um, and what those levels are, it could actually determine if you have an inflammatory response from food sensitivities. So, oh my God, I'm bloated all the time. I feel like crap. Okay, let's take, you know, your, your, your basal body temperature. And if we see that it's consistently high, then what happens is we can start assuming that it might be specifically the food that you're eating. If you're consistently below 97 Fahrenheit, that means that you have low thyroid. And if you have more than 18 temperatures in a row that are high, then that is a sign of pregnancy. Cool. So let's get more deep into like what BBT is. 
So it should be taken every morning. Your basal body temperature should be taken every morning, first thing upon waking. Now you don't need to do this for the rest of your life. This is like, if you're in a discovery phase and you're trying to learn more about your hormones and you want to feel more connected to your body and you just want to feel more energized and like, it's important to start tracking your cycle. If you want to get a deeper glance at what's actually happening under the hood or on a deeper level yourself advocating for yourself. So a basal thermometer records the temperature in the hundreds of a degree, which makes it more accurate for small temperature changes. So before ovulation, your waking temperature tends to be low. You want to be anywhere between 97 Fahrenheit to 97.7 Fahrenheit or 36 degrees to 36.5. Okay. Then a day or two after ovulation, your body, your basal body temperature will typically rise to at least a several of tenths of a degree and stay elevated until the next period. And then post-ovulatory temperatures usually rise to 97.8 or higher. So just so that you know where these ranges should be, because if, if they're higher or lower, we can, we can typically then find a trend and know that something's off. And that's information that's important to bring forth to your general practitioner. Without this kind of information, they're just going to dismiss you because they don't have the information that they need to understand you. And if they see that you're keeping track of this stuff, they're going to actually be like, wow, this, this, this woman's really advocating for herself. Maybe I should look more into this stuff with her and like work closer to her. A lot of us just don't really know what to look for. Now you do. Okay, so step three and four is the position of your cervix and then also the symptoms that you're dealing with. So the, the cervix is usually firm and remains low and closed throughout most of the cycle. However, as estrogen increases during the lead up to ovulation, the cervix becomes soft, moves up higher, opens up and produces the characteristic fertile quality cervical fluid. So the cervix position can be felt by checking internally as well. Okay. But it's supposed to be like usually low. If it's not, then you know that there's something happening and your body's not producing enough estrogen. Okay. And then lastly, like you should note your energy levels as well. So like, how are your, how are your bowel movements? Are you going at least, you know, three, like two to three times a day minimum? You know, how's your, uh, your uh, sex drive, your sexual activity, your mood, your travel, because your travel can affect all of these things um your alcohol consumption your sleep these things are all going to affect everything else so these are things we want to consider before jumping to conclusions like just ask yourself if these things could be better and how you can go about improving them like we all know that if we want to have better bowel movements we can go for more walks to help with bowel motility we can also increase more fiber stuff like that um cool guys we're we're getting through it we're getting through it so what is menopause or postmenopause it is a stage in a woman's life where she permanently stops having menstrual periods and is no longer able to conceive naturally. It is officially diagnosed when a woman has gone 12 consecutive months with a menstrual period. Menopause marks the end. And, and I hear so many women say like, I think I'm menopausal. Like, I don't know though, because they don't really go and check. They don't like want to admit it. They feel like, oh, I'm menopausal. So I'm old, but it's not the case. Like a lot of people, there's even women that have gone into menopause in their mid thirties for, you know, like surgical menopause, for example, if you've had radiation or breast cancer, that usually forces women to jump right into menopause, like pretty quickly. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're old. It happens to people that are, you know, in their thirties too. Um, so during menopause, the ovaries stop releasing eggs. Again, that's why you don't have your cycle anymore. And the production of the hormones, estrogen, progesterone declines significantly. This hormonal shift can lead to various symptoms such as hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, mood swings, and changes in energy levels. Menopause also increases the risk for certain health conditions such as osteoporosis, cardiovascular and cardiovascular disease due to the lower estrogen levels. Because we know that estrogen is like, um, it like, it makes your life stand go longer. It, how, it's, it preserves your health. It preserves your health. Your mic's muted. Okay. So now that we know what menopause is, Let's talk about your adrenal health. So remember when, when I was mentioning earlier about the pyramid? So the pyramid, we start with your blood sugar and your adrenal. So now we're getting right into what you can actually do to help optimize your hormones. Daily living causes stress. There's literally no way around it. We're going to get stressed over the little things, the big things. We can get better at coping, but stress is inevitable. So it's not like we're not going to ever be stressed and that's the goal. Stress and cortisol actually helps us to a degree. Cortisol is at its highest when we wake up in the morning. So that's why, boom, we get up out of bed and we jump out of bed because cortisol is at its highest. We need cortisol if we want to get out of bed and do things. So, um, but if we have too much of it, it's not very good for our adrenal glands. And so what happens is if we're constantly in this fight or flight, then, and we're not regulating our stress, 
then we're going to have low levels of estrogen, high levels. So we're going to have high levels of estrogen, low levels of progesterone, which is that calming hormone. Because what happens is when cortisol is really high all the time, we see something called pregnenolone steel. And when this happens, we kind of just like our blood sugar spikes, we have more cravings. And so it's not actually cortisol itself that makes you gain weight. It's the fact that our blood sugar is all over the place. We tend to have low energy levels, more sugar cravings, and we end up overindulging in processed food. And so when we have processed food, it's very easy to overconsume calories, very easy to, you know, then feel really guilty as a result. And it's just this like kind of spiral of like, now you feel guilty. So then you hit effort. And now that, you know, you snacking turns into maybe like a week long binge or a night, like you're just like binging like for one whole night and you feel guilty. And then this makes you feel like you shouldn't eat. And now that now you're not eating, then you feel really hungry. And then that perpetuates a further binge because you didn't eat the next day because you feel like you don't deserve it. So it's just this downward cycle of not managing cortisol and stress. It's not that we don't want cortisol. It's not that we can avoid stress completely. It's that we want to manage it and keep it balanced, for lack of a better term. So um, yeah, we're going to be talking about different ways that you can do that. So a couple ways that we can do this is we want to have lower glycemic foods. So foods that like avoiding carbohydrates is never the answer. If we're avoiding carbs, then simply what we're doing is just giving up altogether and saying and putting all of the blame on one particular food. Some foods that are higher in sugar are going to spike your blood sugar faster. So think chocolate, think Coca-Cola. These are these have a higher glycemic load. And so they spike your blood sugar faster. But if we have foods like a, like a potato, right, or like apples, these have a lower glycemic load and they digest slowly and they and your blood sugar spikes slower. So now you're not having all of these rises and spikes. Remember, if you want balanced hormones, we also want balanced blood sugar. But cutting out carbs isn't going to help you have stable blood sugar. If you've done keto before, you've probably heard that they'll just say like, you know, oh, but like carbs aren't actually essential. Because we've adapted over time to survive and carbs weren't always abundant, right? Like if you were living in the Arctic, there's no vegetation, there's no fiber, there's no carbs. You're eating seal flubber and meat. You're eating fat and protein, right? So that's how we've adapted to survive, but it doesn't mean that you're thriving, right? So what happens is if we don't have carbs, our body goes through this like survival mode, which we don't want, by the way, and our body will start producing um, it'll go through gluconeogenesis, which is where your body actually uses protein and converts it into sugar. And so that's like ketones and stuff like that. Your body produces, it gets into ketosis. And so people think this is a good thing because now you're using fat as energy. But the truth is you're actually only using fat that you consume as energy, not body fat, but it's marketing, right? Oh my God, we can market this. It sounds perfect to market to them. They, they think that they're going to lose, they're actually using body fat as energy. What you're actually using is energy from the fat that you're consuming, right? So now you're eating more fat. It makes more sense. Now you're burning more fat from the food you're consuming because you're eating more of it. If you have less fat in your diet, you're burning less fat from the food you eat, right? So, and then, so this leads me to the next part is that like insulin, right? You might be afraid that like insulin is what's making you gain weight, but when you become insulin resistant, right? When your body stops uh, kind of recognizing what insulin does and there's too much insulin and your blood sugar is too high and you become diabetic, X, Y, Z. It's really just weight gain is 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 a cause of over consuming too much sugar, too much calories altogether. So how do you know how much is what? Your daughter, for example, who's five years old, shouldn't be eating the same amount of food as you as a fully grown woman. But most toddlers need 1500 calories a day. So what does that mean for you as a fully grown woman who wants to be more fit, wants to be more active? Like you shouldn't be only consuming 1500 calories a day. That's how much a toddler should be eating. So all things considered, most women should be averaging around, like, I'd say like an average is around 2000 calories a day to maintain their weight, but everyone's different. Like if you weigh 300 pounds, you're probably going to need to eat at least 27 to 3, 2700 to 3000 calories a day. If you weigh 150 pounds, you're probably going to have to eat half as much as that, right? So it's very important that you understand individuality, but a good place to start for calories, if you just want to have the best starting range to eat enough calories to give you energy, to have stable blood sugar, to have stable energy. Let's take your goal weight wherever you think you're going to feel your best and multiply that number by 12. Okay. If you multiply that number, like let's just say you're just for the sake of math, 100 pounds. You want your goal weight's 100 pounds. That's very unrealistic for a lot of people, unless you're like four foot 10. Um, 100 times 12, 1200 calories. But nobody here is under four foot 10. Um, yeah. So 
Like most women need at least 1500 calories, even if they're like five foot two. So yeah. Um, okay. So eat lower glycemic foods. The don't cut out the foods you love either. It's about balance. See, people are very one end of the spectrum or the next. The reason why people have weight gain issues or low energy levels and imbalanced hormones is because it's either they're eating really good food, like really whole foods, I should say. And then they're eating or they're eating really processed food, which isn't necessarily bad itself. It's just when we overconsume processed food, we feel like crap. When we consume whole foods, we feel better because there's less processed stuff in it. Simple as that. But a lot of our clients, just to be very clear, have processed food and they still lose body fat and they still see that their A1C goes down and they still see that like I have clients enjoying ice cream each night of the week. And when they go visit their doctor for their checkup, they're coming off of their blood pressure or their their diabetes medication. They're coming off of metformin, stuff like this, because they're not over consuming it. So it's all about balance. You know, I want you to think about adding in more vegetables, adding in more protein, adding in more low glycemic foods, as opposed to like cutting out anything that isn't that because that's not the right mindset. Cool. Next thing is like, realize how I say crowd out alcohol, caffeine and tobacco. I'm not saying cut out. Crowd out means if you are going to have alcohol, keep it to a minimum, keep it to a glass. If you're having more than that, your body just can't process alcohol the way that it used to. And we'll be honest, like you're, it's, it's a toxin, right? You're intoxicating yourself. So it's going to stop the function of the liver. And your liver is very important in this process of having balanced hormones. So I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying cut out alcohol, I'm saying crowd it out. Same thing with caffeine. Like if you're relying on three, four, five cups of coffee a day, like eventually that's going to be a lot of cortisol. Your body's always in a, in a high stress state. We know that that's going to affect your adrenals. It's going to affect your blood sugar. It's going to affect your cravings, how, how your mood is, how your energy is. So we want to have like one or two cups of coffee a day. I think that the, we want to have 150 milligrams of caffeine max per day. And then as for smoking, like keep like crowded out, like, right. If you can't cut it out, then focus on better alternatives and, you know, be kind to yourself nonetheless, because me telling anybody to cut something out is me being very incompassionate and we can't change ourselves if we're beating ourselves up. And that's something that a lot of us do really well. We beat ourselves up into change, but it never lasts. And so if you want to actually see lasting change, we need to be more compassionate to ourselves and we need to find better alternatives for ourselves and integrate that into our lifestyle slowly over time. Um, okay. Get more, plen get plenty of omega threes. You can get that from like eggs and stuff like that, like oily fish. And then uh, consume a widely colored diet, including dark colored fruits and vegetables. Cool. So um, I went over this in my initial training about two weeks ago. I'm just going to kind of scroll through this. You guys can feel free to take screenshots. Um, otherwise this training will be hours long if I go over everything, but I I'll just jump through this really quickly. So common symptoms of low progesterone, just so that you can kind of see if you're struggling with some of these is like, you feel like, um, you know, you have breakthrough bleeding in your luteal phase, which is that second half of your cycle. You have migraines, you're really bloated, you have really bad PMS. So your mood is all over the place. Um, and that's because again, progesterone is that calming hormone. So low progesterone can be resulted from um, xenoestrogens, like I mentioned before, from plastics and other toxins in the environment that block your estrogen receptors. Okay. So that's, that's why we want to have more green cleaning products, for example. Uh, also when cortisol is really high, that's what I mentioned causes pregnenolone steel, which is when cortisol blocks progesterone receptors and it makes those receptors less responsive to progesterone. So high cortisol means that you typically have low progesterone and high estrogen. And that's when you have estrogen dominance, which leads me to the next part. High estrogen, aka estrogen dominance, is when essentially like you start to, well, you have high levels of estrogen and xenoestrogens like BPA and phthalates mimic estrogen in the body, which tricks the body into estrogen dominance. So it's, it works all together. Like when you have more estrogen, you have less progesterone, right? That's why it says low, low progesterone can be resulted from xenoestrogens. And so on this end of the things, it's that now that you have more estrogen in your body, you have less progesterone in comparison. So now you have higher levels. Now your, your progesterone might be the exact same amount, but your estrogen levels are higher. So again, you have more of one or the other. It's not about the amount. It's more so in comparison, which one's higher or lower because they want to be in balance, right? So also if you have excess body fat, that can lead to higher levels of estrogen since fat is estrogenic and that leads to estrogen dominance. 
alcohol in excess contributes to estrogen dominance as well and results in early menopause. So if you are consuming more than five to seven glasses of alcohol per week, like this is in excess in my opinion. So we want to stick to have more, like no more than one glass per day, if not try to refrain as much as we can from having alcohol. It just doesn't agree with your body the way that it used to. So symptoms are heavy bleeding, PMS, fibroids, PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, migraines, moodiness, meltdown, depressions, uh, meltdowns, depression, ovulatory pain, and brain fog. And then we have low estrogen. So we said high estrogen before. Now this is low estrogen, which is typically caused by malnourishment from low calorie diets, from doing excess amounts of cardio, maybe uh, oral contraceptives like birth control. And some of the symptoms are like oligomenorrhea, amenorrhea, which is the absence of a cycle for three or more months, painful sex, hot flashes, joint pain, dry eyes or skin, um, low sex drive, depression, and poor cognitive function or memory. Okay. And then we have excess androgens. So this is the last part, which is that testosterone and DHEA. If you have excess, this should never be ignored because excess androgens are caused by high insulin levels. So that's why women with PCOS typically have high insulin levels and also have higher levels of testosterone. So this can cause your ovaries to produce more testosterone and hormonal birth controls that contain that contain synthetic progestins. I want to share with you guys as well, if you're on birth control still, I'm actually curious, like a lot of doctors will tell you that you're taking progesterone as you're taking birth control, but what you're actually taking is proge uh, synthetic progestins, which aren't the same. It's, it's, um, it's synthetic, so your body doesn't react to it the same way. There's a lot more complications and risks associated with that. So to say that birth control is a replacement for progesterone is not true. It's a synthetic progestin. It's not recommended. It's much better, in my opinion, to go for like a bioidentical hormone of progesterone, which is available. Yeah. But um, androgens affects things like hair loss in women and high cortisol is where the is, is is from the adrenals right so your hypothalamus tells your adrenals to release cortisol and 50 percent of your androgens which is your testosterone and your dhea is produced in the adrenals so when one adrenal hormone is affected it affects all your hormones because if now your testosterone is out of whack so is your estrogen and then it's a domino effect that's how hormones work together it's a domino effect if one is affected it, it teeter totters and now you're out of balance Okay. I don't know if I said this before, but I like to think about hormone balance as like an orchestra of instruments. If one instrument is out of tune, it makes all the other instruments go out of tune as well. They all start playing and sounding like shit. So we got to make sure that everything is in tune. Um, excess body fat can also cause excess estrogen, like I said, and this affects the production of androgens because we, again, we want to have, we still want to produce testosterone. And if you have too much body fat, that's going to affect how much testosterone you have. If you have too much Body fat, you have too much estrogen, which will affect your testosterone. Cool. Uh, androgens in excess can cause unstable blood sugar, so more sugar cravings. Hypo or hyperglycemia, which is where you have too much or too little sugar in your bloodstream. Longer menstrual cycles, mid-cycle pain, acne or oily skin, hair loss, and then again, PCOS. So now this is the last part, low androgens. We talked about high androgens. Low androgens are when the adrenal glands essentially just like stop producing as much testosterone because that's where 50% of your androgens are created in your adrenal glands. So too low. And what you'll notice is that you don't have that spice and that edge and that high sex drive and that supple skin and lower, like lower levels are going to lead to lower confidence. And which is a very interesting, very low risk tolerance. So if you don't find that you're worth investing in, or you don't find that you belong and that you want to go and socialize and this can typically be a sign of low androgens, low testosterone. And so this can also be caused by birth control, which is why it's very important to inquire what kind of contraceptives to use. Okay. It's very important that we take as much of a natural approach as we can. Um, if you have had the removal of your ovaries, like a hysterectomy, um, menopause as well, these are all going to affect your androgen levels. And the symptoms are low sex drive, painful sex, vaginal dryness, decreased muscle mass, and no motivation. So you can understand now why having an ample amount of testosterone is important. Exactly how much you need of everything, the progesterone, DHE, testosterone. I'm going to give you guys those optimal ranges as the last slide. So you can take a screenshot and refer them to your doctor, your GP, your OBGYN when you get your blood work done. Um, 
and you'll know where you should be versus what is normal because normal for most people is they're struggling. Like normal, even at normal levels, most women are still struggling. So how can we have optimal levels, right? That's what we're talking about today. Um, I already kind of mentioned this part here, but you know, when one of these hormones are off, at least one or another hormone is guaranteed to be off as well. So cool. Um, kind of already went over this. Okay, cool. So these are, you guys can feel free to take a screenshot of some of these ranges here, these optimal ranges. We have your, um, your CBC, so your complete blood count. That's what you're going to want to get done, which is your white blood cells, hemoglobin. Um, we have your hematocrit. Um, we have your platelets, your folate, your vitamin B12. All of these things you're going to want to do your best to get tested because these are the levels you're going to want to be at. Um, forget kind of like the ranges for the men. I think that I have some ranges for men in here somehow, somewhere. Uh, yeah, just, just here for men. So just focus obviously on the women's levels. But the one that I think you should focus on the most is the cortisol. You can actually take a saliva test um, morning and afternoon, and you should be able to see for yourself from home where your level should be within. And if they're outside of those ranges, then you know for sure that your adrenals need a little bit more support, which is where we're going to start anyways. If we were to start focusing on improving your, you know, your cravings, your blood sugar, your sleep, everything else, we're going to want to start from the bottom up, right? So I'm going to jump to the hormone pyramid here real quick. And then that way we can tie this all together and actually talk about some strategies for you. Oh, by the way, I think that we might've missed a few things here. Hold on. Um, a little delay. Interesting. Okay. Cool. So Let's look at the pyramid. Okay. So I'm you, right? And I'm trying to like figure out how can I have less of these symptoms and start making fat loss easier for me because I feel more energized and I feel like I'm digesting my food well and I don't have as much sugar cravings and I'm not as moody. Like if I want to improve some of these symptoms, I'm immediately going to start with how can I manage my stress better? So grab a pen and paper. I'm just going to give you exactly what I would give my clients if they were right in front of me struggling with these things. Okay. Number one, with your stress management, I would immediately start focusing on how I can make more time for myself to go out on like a periodic walk. I know it sounds silly, but if you go for a walk and you come back, you can't tell me that you don't feel better. It's going to increase your oxygen intake once you're breathing a little bit more and you actually have to breathe through your diaphragm and not just your chest when you walk. So now that you're breathing through your diaphragm, you're improving your blood pressure and your heart rate. And when those come down, right, when your heart rate is regulated, you immediately feel less stressed. So walking is a freaking superpower. Two, even if it's just for five minutes. Two, talking about breathing, deep diaphragmatic breathing. I'm going to kind of just give a little example here. So like, i just put my thing here. Like if I'm doing breath work, what I'm trying to focus on is breathing through my belly. So if I'm stressed and I'm feeling that, and it's going to take time for you to recognize when you're actually stressed versus you just kind of being in a normal state, because maybe you're always stressed and it's hard for you to recognize when you actually are. But the curve of you know managing your blood sugar and balancing your hormones is becoming more self-aware. How do I feel at this moment? All right. Do I have my basic needs met? Have I eaten something for breakfast already? Am I hydrated right now? Do I feel safe where I am right now? Like asking yourself these things and tuning into yourself every once in a while, something that not a lot of people do that you should be doing. So breathe through your belly. You want to do a really big breath through here. So what you're going to do is breathe in as deeply as you can and extend your belly out as far as you can without having your chest move as much. So as deeply as you can and then exhale. And one of my favorite things that you can do is go on YouTube and literally just type in three to five minute deep breathing guided, like a, a guided deep breathing. And it really brings down your nerves and is immediately going to help you be able to reduce your cravings and have more energy throughout your day. Very, very, very important. So that's that. Then we have um, shaking. So shaking sounds crazy, but it was developed by a psychologist um, way back in the day. And uh, it's been used for so long. But essentially, you stand, you stand up and um, you kind of just like jump up and down. I know it sounds silly. So you're probably gonna want to do this on your own. But 
you guys are if you're like 40 50 plus you don't give a shit about what people think about you anymore so anyways like, like you're jumping up and down you're letting your face muscles kind of just hang your jaw hang and you play a song and you dance to it and let your body move to it for like the entire length of that song and make sure that the song is like a rock song or something upbeat. Maybe y'all like Shania Twain or something. I don't know where you're from. Ashley, I feel like maybe you would like Shania Twain. You're from Texas. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but like something like rock music or something like country music, something that gets you pumped. I choose Nickelback. I love I freaking love Nickelback. And uh, and then after that first song's done, come back to yourself and ask yourself how you feel. And after you're done doing that, you're gonna do it once more. So you do that twice. And so it takes you like seven to ten minutes. But doing this game changer you come back you feel so much better you feel like you could take on the world but so many people are so used to neglecting themselves that they don't even pay attention to what's happening to their body and over time this chronic stress just adds up and then you binge eat and then you take out you feel like very very stressful and moody and it does affect your hormones over time it's going to affect your thyroid health it's going to affect your because your pituitary and hypothalamus are connected to your adrenals and your adrenals release cortisol and cortisol affects High levels of cortisol is going to affect your thyroid and your thyroid is going to affect your metabolism because now you, your blood sugar is all over the place and now you're craving sugary foods and now you're over-consuming that. It's this entire chain effect of things that starts with your stress. So we talked about walking, deep diaphragmatic breathing. We talked about shaking. Grounding is another one. So putting your feet into the earth. The reason why I chose to live in a cabin by the ocean and be surrounded by the elements on Vancouver Island is because I did come from a deep rooted place of trauma. And I think that the best place to heal for me is closest to the elements. For me, that's being in the ocean and surfing. I love it. The more that you can go for a walk in nature with your bare feet, or you can even buy ground, you can even buy grounding mats. And essentially like the energy from the earth is, and I know it sounds hippy dippy, but it's a thousand percent true. Like we're all connected to the earth you're going to immediately see a reduction in your blood pressure and your heart rate. And as a result, you will feel less stressed. You'll have more of a dopamine release. Like you, you can't tell me you've never gone into the ocean or gone into the beach or stepped into the woods and didn't feel better coming back, you know? Cool. Last but not least is reframing your stress. Stress can make you smarter. If we didn't stress about things, we wouldn't survive. But with that mindset, if you tell yourself that you're overwhelmed, you're going to get a stress response and still be in negativity. Instead, if you tell yourself that you're just excited instead of overwhelmed, you're coming from a place of compassion and understanding. You're reframing what stress means to you. And you're realizing that, okay, I'm overwhelmed because I have all these things to do. But what I actually am feeling is that I'm excited that I want to see what it's like when I get those things done. It seems like a lot to do, but only because I'm overly excited for it. And I feel like reframing our mind from overwhelmed to excited allows you to release both DHEA, which is a good hormone that releases serotonin and dopamine and all the feel-good hormones while releasing cortisol. So you're getting both. One is like something that we're trying to manage a little bit more, but the other, the other endorphins and hormones are there to actually uplift you. And that's going to help you manage stress as well. If you're feeling busy, you know, we, we, so many women wear a busy, like it's a badge of honor. I'm so busy. Oh, summer was so busy. We want to change our mindsets from busy to productive, right? We want to be productive, not busy. So when you tell yourself that you've been busy, that's a stress response. Oh, I'm so busy. But when you tell yourself you're productive, that doesn't sound stressful. That sounds good, right? So be productive. Don't be busy. And if you do feel busy, just tell yourself, we're trying to be productive here. Because it, it, I feel like it's just that cycle of telling yourself that you're busy that stresses you out in the first place. So overall, I'm not telling you to not be stressed. Stress is a natural part of life. But how we look at stress can change how our body adapts to it and how our body works with it for better or for worse. So I hope that you guys got some value from changing some of the behaviors that you can do at the bottom here. Literally, we just talked about behavior modification. We're not even at meal timing yet. Cool. Did you guys get value from that? Let me know if you guys got value from that. Just go into the chat box or give me a thumbs up. Just want to make sure you guys are getting value so far because we're going to go through meal timing. We're going to go through gut health, probiotics, selenium, iodine, foods, sleep hygiene, nutritional intervention, menopause, hormone therapy, and exercise. So the next part of managing blood sugar and insulin, now that we've kind of handled the cortisol situation, saying, let's see, uh, yes, very informative. Yes, I've been using grounding mat on my bed and honestly feel like I'm sleeping deeper. Heck yeah. Um, Letitia says, I'm in Texas too. Letitia and Ashley, you guys will be like besties now. Um uh, by the way, Letitia's inside of the program as well, Ashley, which is super cool. Um, cool. Awesome. So back to insulin, blood sugar. So 
if you want to be able to, you know, go into remission with diabetes and you want to like get out of it and you want to have more stable blood sugar, all we need to do is just focus on foods that are less processed and that are more whole. That doesn't mean that you cut out your McDonald's burger if you're running through a drive-thru and it's been a busy day. You should be able to fit that into your nutrition, which is what we teach our clients with our midlife macro method. But, and we'll get to that afterwards. I want to give you, if you guys have time and you guys want to stick to the end, I'm giving you it all. I'm giving you all the goodies, but um, particularly foods that are higher in fiber. Why? When you have sugar and you pair it with fats as well, that's going to slow down the digestion because that's what one of fats major roles is slowing down blood sugar, slowing down the digestion of sugars. And now you have more stable blood sugar. But when you only have sugar, think a muffin. It's like 80% of that muffin is carbs. 20, like 10% of it is like 15% of it is fat. And like 5% of it is protein. So like the majority of it's sugar. It's just going to spike your blood sugar really fast. So that's why you want to pair a muffin with some eggs or pair a muffin with some peanut butter or pair a muffin with, um, you know, a smoothie that has healthy fats in it, stuff like that. Um, that's going to stabilize your blood sugar. The reason why people have high blood sugar is because the majority of the foods that they're consuming are carbohydrate based, are very low in fat and very low in protein. So that's the issue. It's not that carbs are the problem. It's that they're over consuming. If you over consume fat, if you over consume protein, you'd still have high blood sugar levels because almost everything contributes to every food spikes your blood sugar, just more or less. So, but when you over consume anything, it's going to spike your blood sugar nexus. It's just the like 70% of the American diet is like, carbohydrate based, right? So it's just inevitable that like the food that we're going to choose to blame first is carbs because it makes up the most of your diet, but it's not carbs fault. It's that we just over consume it and you over consume it because you don't understand how to eat in the right amount for you because you don't know how to eat in proper portions because you don't understand our midlife macro method, which is very easy, very simple. Our clients eat burgers and tacos and ice cream more nights of the week than not. And they don't avoid carbs because they know that carbs is what's going to fuel their workout. And our brains function way better when we have glucose, which is carbs. Our body consumes sugar and then it converts it into glucose. And then our body uses it, like our muscles use it as energy. It's our primary fuel source. Carbs are our primary fuel source. That's why when you have sugar, you feel immediately energized. But it's the quality that keeps you energized. Okay. It's the quality of the sugar that keeps you energized. That's the very first thing. Uh timing. You want to be eating every three to four hours minimum. I would not recommend fasting. If you fast until noon, you're going to be that's you not eating for 16 hours, like 12 to 16 hours. And then that's you having a massive spike in blood sugar and a massive crash. And then you're not getting in enough protein at the end of the day because you only have eight hours in a day to eat now, right? Because you're fasting from 12 till 12 and now you're up until eight or nine. So now you're only up for eight or nine hours. How are you going to get in enough protein in only eight hours? Especially because protein is very filling, which leads me to protein. Like protein is going to help you die to be able to stabilize blood sugar as well. So just like how fat helps you slow down uh, the absorption of sugar and stabilize blood sugar instead of it spiking. Protein has a very similar function. So protein is going to help you slow down the absorption of sugar and have more stable blood sugar. Because if you have too much sugar in your bloodstream, that's when we start getting that traffic jam and you in high blood sugar it leads to type one diabetes. And then we'll become insulin resistant because our, 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 our receptors in our body are no longer recognizing insulin anymore. So then that's when we become, become diabetic, you know? So, um, it's very important that we focus on lower glycemic foods as much as we can. We focus on eating at least every three to four hours. You're having a balanced meal that has carbs, fat, and protein at every meal. And not just choosing meals that are higher in carb itself and like protein. We want to have a balanced meal. The only time that I would um, deny this claim is before your workout, you want to have fast energy. So it's okay around your workout or times when you're being very active to have something that's predominantly sugar. That's why Gatorade is advertised for sport, right? It's, it's literally sugar in a bottle. So that's fine. Like you're utilizing that sugar as energy in the moment. So you're not just sitting down on the couch and hanging out and your blood sugars, your blood, your sugar's not doing anything. It's just sitting around, sitting around in your bloodstream. And now you have a sugar crash. And now because you have a sugar crash, you crave sugar more because now your blood sugar is low. So that leads me to the very last point. This is my last point. After you're done eating, you shouldn't sit down and digest. The worst thing that you can do after you eat a meal is sit down and digest. Because when you go for a walk, you're helping your body digest that food. You're utilizing the energy that you just consumed. And so you're using that sugar. But if you sit down, again, you're not. So it's actually going to just lead you to a bigger sugar crash. That's why when you eat pasta or when you finish Thanksgiving dinner, you feel like just sitting on the couch and laying down like, oh, I'm in a coma. Because 
your blood sugar crash because you didn't do anything with that energy. So go for a five minute walk after a meal. If you can, if you can, don't take everything I take to an extreme and feel overwhelmed. Just when you can do that. Okay. Uh, Leticia said, that's what I, that's what I've been finding. Now I eat breakfast. My glucose numbers have been consistently lower now that I've been hitting my protein goal. Absolutely. And Leticia has been in the program. She's, she's in our program right now. She's been in the program for like three, four weeks. Her blood sugar levels are getting better. A1C is dropping. Like everything's getting better. She's been with us for like three, four weeks. Super proud of you, Leticia. Super proud of you. Okay. So um, we already talked about stress management techniques. Um, so we don't really need to go much further with that. If you want my stress management ebook that kind of just shared everything that I just went over, you just want to copy for yourself. Um, I will send it to you. Just shoot me a message after tonight's training. Okay. Now we're going to talk about your thyroid. So the next step after you focused on step one, which is honestly going to make such a big difference with your hormone levels. Once we finish that step one, then you, you know, focus on cortisol, insulin and blood sugar, oxytocin, just really getting a little bit more connected to your loved ones. A really good tool for increasing oxytocin is like giving yourself a massage with like, uh, with essential, like a lotion that has really nice essential oils, like lavender and, you know, having a really good sleep routine where like you, you know, go in the bathtub and, you know, just like a more of like a sensual, you know, vibe at the end of each day can help increase oxytocin, but so can, you know, giving people a hug. So can being involved in a community that is uplifting, which is why I'm so big on community. Like in our program, community is everything. Like all the women in our program, they're so loving and supportive of one another. Like, Ashley, I know that you're just jumping into this now and Ashley just joined the program last week and she'll be coming into the community here shortly. But like, once you jump into the community, which you can find in the welcome package, like you, like there's just so much love and I feel like that's what a lot of women are missing is that oxytocin, which is such an important hormone that we find through connection to ourselves and with others. So with gut health, it's immediately going to improve your thyroid health, which is stage, it's like step two. Step two is to improve your thyroid, your pregnenolone, your DHEA. We need to start focusing on the quality of your gut health. And that means that you're having foods that are fermented. So probiotics is what we want to have first. Probiotics are bacteria that help us digest food. So when you're thinking, Marissa just was thinking about it. I love you so much. Thank you so much for listening. Um, sauerkraut is a fermented food, but you want to go to the refrigerated section. So the refrigerated section is going to like, if it's not refrigerated, there's not real bacteria in it. It's processed, right? To stay, to stay good. And for it to not go rotten, it needs to stay refrigerated. And that's how you know it's the real stuff. And how you know is what's that? Oh yeah. Like it should say raw unpasteurized as well. So this has one tablespoon of sauerkraut, for example, has way more benefits and probiotics than any supplement that you will find. And it is like one tenth the cost. So I bought that for like seven, eight bucks, but you're going to go and buy a probiotic supplement for 50, $60. And it's so low quality. Your body's not even going to absorb it. So stop, in my opinion, stop taking probiotics because you can get it naturally from foods that are fermented like Greek yogurt sauerkraut, kimchi, actual fermented pickles and stuff like that, kefir. Yeah, like just fermented foods like that. There's even kefir water. So kombucha is another good one. Um, let me just make sure you guys got all your questions answered. Uh, how do you eat sauerkraut? What do you put it on? So I typically put sauerkraut on like a hot dog or like a sandwich marissa put sauerkraut on my so sometimes she'll make ground beef with like tomatoes and cruciferous veggies and like just like make this whole ground beef medley and then i'll put it on my sourdough which is another really good probiotic because it's fermented right you sourdough is all fermented so on my sourdough i'll put the ground beef for high protein and then on top of that i'll put my sauerkraut and it's delicious there's a ton of different flavors of of, of sauerkraut too like there's a beet ginger, yeah, there's a beet ginger one and Marissa puts that on her salad. So that's, that's a, that's a really good, like, that's probably my favorite meal with it. Um, I would also say that fiber, now we're talking about probiotics, fiber is what is going to feed that bacteria. So if you're not having enough fiber, which is made with carbs, right? Like carbs and fiber are the same. So to say that you don't want carbs means that you're also saying you don't want to get fiber. Now there is fiber in some fats like avocado but there's also carbs in avocado as well. Like you can't really escape it. So carbohydrates are very vital, very important in helping you be able to have proper gut health to help improve your thyroid function. Because if your thyroid is low, you're going to feel really tired. 
you're going to have a really hard time feeling motivated and wanting to exercise. And yeah, it's just going to slow down all of your metabolic functions. So you're just not going to have stable blood sugar. You're not going to, it's going to affect everything else down the chain. So that's why it's so important that you focus on fiber, foods that are higher in fiber, apples, you know, the skin on potatoes, keeping the skin on your potatoes, fruit, oats, rice, berries. Yeah, berries are one of my favorite. There's lots of the, like, like one cup of raspberries, like, and it, like such a ridiculous amount of fiber. Yeah, my breakfast every day, so easy, high protein. Ready? Marissa just said, you should tell them about your breakfast. So literally five mason jar containers. This is my breakfast every day. Quarter cup or half a cup, however much makes sense for you and based on how much you need to eat of oats in a mason jar. Then you do your uh, your milk of choice. So I use a high protein milk. So I use the Fair Life protein milk or water. And then you add your protein powder and then you shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. And you, on top of that, you put your fruit, like your raspberries, your blackberries, and you can just like get a, like a, a bag of frozen berries. Cheaper, lasts longer, less preservatives too, actually, because the way that they preserve it is frozen instead of like on the shelves and having to use preservatives. And then you can put like chia seeds on top, which can really help with like bowel motility. And also like there's some protein in chia seeds as well and some healthy fats. And then you just put it in the fridge. Boom. Now you have breakfast every morning, 40, 50 grams of protein in each one, tons of fiber, like literally a quarter cup of a quarter cup of oats has like 10 grams of fiber. Then the raspberries have like another five or six grams. Now you're sitting at like 15, 16 grams of fiber. And most women only need, and the chia seeds have fiber. So you're probably getting around 20 grams of fiber for breakfast. And most women only need around 25 grams of fiber per day. And so many women say like, oh, how do I get in enough fiber? And the reason why most people overconsume calories by accident is because all the food they consume is very low in fiber. Fiber is very filling, very satiating. Same thing with protein. Protein is very satiating. So when we focus on getting in at least 25 grams of fiber a day, when we focus on getting at least 100 plus grams of protein a day, it's nearly impossible to overconsume calories. Nearly impossible because you're too full. Too full. And your blood sugar is pretty stable because that fiber is helping digest food. It's helping stabilize your blood sugar. So now you, you just don't really feel like having foods that are higher calorie. Okay. Uh, Letitia says, how much milk do you put in it? Uh, quarter cup, but it's really just preference. Like, if I need a little bit more protein, I'll add in more. But it, it also depends on the consistency that you like. So, yeah. It's very important that I say you put the quarter cup of milk in and then you put the protein powder on top and you shake that first or else it's going to get comfy. So, like, not yeah. so much milk in it when you're shaking the protein powder method. Okay. Fix it. Got it. Okay. So, that is uh, the fiber situation. Cool. Awesome. Guys, stick with me. We're almost done here today. I just want to give you guys all the goodies still. Um, so, now we're talking about improving thyroid function so that we can make fat loss even easier. Cause if you want a more, even if you aren't making, so we have T3, so there's inactive thyroid hormone T4 and an active thyroid hormone T3. If we want to make more active thyroid hormone T3, it is going to be created in our liver. Most of it in our liver, not just our thyroid. So if you want to be able to improve liver function, we need to have foods that are higher in selenium and iodine. A simple thing that you can do is add in one Brazil nut a day. It's got your daily recommended intake for selenium. Um, so I'd highly recommend that. Uh, iodine foods. You can get things that are like, you know, you can get kelp. You can get sardines. You can get, uh, um, you know, clams, like spinach. Yeah, like these kinds of foods. And you can just search it up online too. Foods that are higher in iodine and selenium are foods that you want to prioritize throughout your day to improve your thyroid health. Even if you don't have a thyroid right now, or you have a low functioning thyroid, like you can definitely improve your thyroid health by consuming foods that are higher in selenium and iodine. Okay, cool. Then, we, then we're going to be talking about melatonin. So melatonin is going to come down to your sleep hygiene. Okay. If you want to improve, if, if like you've done everything else below and you're still feeling crappy, there's a good chance that your sleep hygiene is horrible. <laughs> and you want to focus on calming yourself down by having less blue light after around 8 p.m. So right now it's 8 p.m. for you guys. And more days of the week than not, you're probably on your phone scrolling through Instagram. And what happens is your eyes will see that there's blue light, which is no different than sunlight. And so now your brain isn't registering that it's nighttime. And so now your body's not releasing melatonin. And so now that it's not releasing melatonin, you're having a really hard time falling asleep or staying asleep. And so that's why most women get up at 2 or 3 p.m. 
their 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 sleep hygiene is horrible their melatonin levels are all over the place and obviously there are so many other reasons like your estrogen progesterone levels fluctuating as well like that's going to cause other symptoms like hot flashes which get you up at night but like if you've already addressed some of the other things i've mentioned today like the sleep hygiene sorry like the stress management the meal timing you know focusing on your blood sugar and your insulin levels by eating uh you know at, you know every three four hours having foods that are, have a lower glycemic load um having more fiber having more probiotics like you're doing these things you're probably not gonna have to worry about this but like like you're you're probably not gonna have those same symptoms at night you're probably those are those will be a little bit more resolved minimized but let's just say they're not then less blue light at night then another thing is reading a book at night instead can call can calm down your nerves having a tea like a lavender tea a chamomile tea or a lavender tea chamomile tea what else yeah, like cinnamon, stuff like that really calms you down. Licorice tea is another really good one. Um, yeah, so that. And then also um, getting to bed at the same time each day and getting up at the same time each day will make you feel more energized. See, some people tell me, oh, I actually get better sleep when I sleep for six hours, not eight. Or when I sleep for five hours, not eight. I've been getting eight hours and I feel like crap. It's because you're getting up and going, you're getting up and sleeping at a completely different time. Now you're just trying something new and now your body's waking up when it would otherwise be sleeping or vice versa. Like it's just your, your sleep schedule is out of whack. So if you want to reset your melatonin, we want to ideally, if you can get up as the sun rises and then get ready for bed as the sun falls. And that is how our body's natural circadian rhythm, which is our body's internal clock tells us to start producing melatonin and stuff like that. But if you're just staying up till 2 a.m., 12, 11, you're waking up at different times, this, that, like your body is never going to be really working with you. It's always just going to be really confused on when it should be producing melatonin and whatnot. So it's very important. Um, what else can I say? You know, I just say like breath work and stress reduction. Our, our cortisol can be high at night. And if it is, then we're going to have a hard time sleeping. So reducing cortisol could help increase melatonin. So that's important. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for sleep hygiene. I know it's very basic. Uh, and last but not least, let's talk about testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. So you guys saw those lab, um, you know, those lab values. So now that you can look at your own blood work and look at these references and say, are is everything within range the way that it should be looking on at my blood work here? If it's not, something that we can always do, which I am a big fan and believer of, is menopause hormone therapy. So yes, it's going to cost money out of pocket, but like you don't need to struggle through menopause because it's fate. Like struggling through menopause is a choice. And for some people, they just don't have the funds and that's completely different. But for those of you that feel like you have to live with low levels of estrogen and progesterone and all of these other androgens, if you don't, you can take them exogenously and you can use the exact same hormones that you've had for the last 40 years of your life. For the majority of your life, you can get them back. The exact ones that your body creates through bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. And there are less negative side effects if any side effects when you're taking a bioidentical hormone replacement therapy because it's not synthetic. So I, I, you know, people say which one's better, synthetic hormones or bioidentical? It just to me makes more sense to take bioidentical because it's what is identical to what your body makes. So again, you've been making these hormones your whole life. If you want to reduce some of these symptoms that you're dealing with, you can totally take a bioidentical hormone replacement therapy and go to your local naturopath. If you're getting dismissed by a local doctor, Visit the website, thepauselife.com. It was created by Dr. Mary Claire Haver. And they have an entire directory of recommended physicians that have worked really well with women who need help with menopause. Because like I mentioned, only like something small, like four to 6% of doctors feel comfortable treating women in menopause. They just don't have the education to support it if they didn't increase their education after residency, which most don't because they're overworked. So if you want that directory, visit thepauselife.com. I'm not affiliated with it at all. I'm just wanting to share it with you because I can see like most women run around finding four five, six doctors before they actually get what they need. So then they struggle and they struggle and they struggle and they try to avoid hormones. They don't want to take it. But if you're doing what I just mentioned right here, you're ticking off all the lifestyle boxes. You're working out three days a week, 30, 40 minutes, lifting heavy weights. You're prioritizing weight training. You're going for regular walks throughout the day. Every week you're trying to Get a little bit more steps than you did last week. Let's simply put it at that. Because I'm not the biggest believer of immediately aiming for 10,000 steps. I think that there are clients that improve their blood, their, you know, their, their labs and their blood sugar and their energy levels and they lose body fat. And they're only averaging 4,000, 5,000 steps because they're prioritizing their nutrition. 
right? I feel like walking more, you just burn out if you're not focusing on your nutrition, if you're not eating enough protein, enough calories. So I'm not a big fan of the 10,000 steps thing. It's just not necessary. It's just a general rule of thumb, but it doesn't suit everyone. Like if you're 300 pounds right now, or even 250 pounds, like your knees are going to kill you if you're trying to walk 10,000 steps right now. So walking more, working out three days a week, you're focusing on all the other things I just mentioned, like, and you're still struggling, look no further than menopause hormone therapy. And if your doctor is telling you that your blood, you know, your, your, your labs are normal, look back at the reference ranges I just sent you. Those labs that doctors use are not functional labs. They like, they, they don't take a functional health perspective. So as a result, they're far too generous. Unless you are like really out of range, then they're not going to tell you that, you know, they're not going to tell you that there's something wrong. But again, it's too generous. So that's why you feel the way you feel, even if they tell you you're normal. So that's why you need to find another doctor. You need to find another doctor. And that's why I recommend that directory. So that is pretty much it. When you come into our program, we can help you get blood work done. I will work with you on that. When you come into our program, we will help you make all these behavior modifications and we will make it less overwhelming because we will do things one step at a time. We will focus on gut health if you need to start focusing on that more. But most of the women that are watching this in our program, if they're not following those protocols right now, it's because they don't need to right now. There's nothing that's pointing us in the direction that we need to start doing all these things all at once. It's just not realistic. We want to focus on one piece of the puzzle at a time. And oftentimes, like 90% of the times, women are able to still lose all the weight and more and keep it off and join all the foods that they and their family love without having to do 50% of this. You know, by default, because they're eating enough protein and calories and enough fiber, their blood sugar stable. Because they're exercising three days a week, four days a week for 30 to 45 minutes, they have less stress. And because they're in community, their oxytocin levels are improved. And because they have, they're more productive and they're feeling less stressed, aka busy, they can get to sleep better. And so their melatonin levels are better and their thyroid's better and their pregnenolone levels and DHE levels are, are better. Everything's better. As a result, they don't really need to climb up the top of that period oftentimes. So, but so many women are so quick to blame the top of that pyramid instead of the bottom. They're saying it's my testosterone, it's my estrogen, it's my progesterone. And even though they might be right, they're still missing the basics. And that's why they feel even worse. And even if they did take those hormones, they would still feel like shit because they're not marking off the lifestyle boxes that I just mentioned. They're avoiding it. And the truth is, I'm going to end it on this note. The results that you're looking for that you ultimately want for yourself to feel better, to look better, to have confidence in yourself, to have energy is in the work that you are avoiding. It is in the basics, but you don't have any accountability. You don't have any support, any support. You don't have a plan that is sustainable for you to continue doing. Instead, you might go for keto again. You might start intermittent fasting because you heard that this would be better for you. And like they work until they don't. That's the thing is that they will work, but they just don't, you can't do that forever. How long are you going to skip it on breakfast for the rest of your life and not enjoy breakfast with your family? I don't tell people not to do these things repetitively over and over again, because eventually they learn that, okay, this isn't working anymore. So I'm just going to tell you now, like with what I taught you here, you'll be good. And with the macro training, I sent it to you guys already via email, but in short, like we have an entire midlife macro method training that teaches our clients how to eat in the right amount and learn portion sizes so that they don't need to log or track food for the rest of their lives ever again. And we only focus on calories and protein in this program. We don't track carbs. We don't track fat. We don't track protein and calories altogether. Just a calorie range and a protein range. And because of that, there's less overwhelm. There's way more clarity on them getting in enough calories and protein, and which matters most with weight loss. And then as soon as they get really consistent with that, they can kind of, they never had to cut anything out. Didn't really matter how much carbs or fat they had. They were still losing weight because calories were accounted for and protein was there. So they maintained muscle mass so that they didn't lose muscle while they were losing weight. And like, they're not afraid of carbs anymore. And because they, they've tracked it in the past for a very short period of time, they have the awareness around how much food they, they need to be eating. And out of the program, they can eat intuitively, meaning they don't need to log anything and they know how much they should have for the rest of their life. And I think that that's what most women are avoiding. They're avoiding having somebody be able to look into their nutrition on a daily basis because I can see everything my clients see because they're afraid to finally look at the actual problem, which is, that you are not in control of how much you're consuming. And that is the biggest issue nowadays. People overestimate the amount of calories they're burning. And they underestimate how much they're consuming. And they only stick to clean foods, but even then they still struggle because they're still not 
admitting the fact that they need to learn how to eat enough calories and protein. They're just not willing to measure or track it for a short period of time. And as a result, they just see the same problem over and over and over again. They lose the weight, they gain the weight, they lose the weight because they think it's a particular food that's stopping them from losing weight or that is making them gain weight, but it never was. It's always been the amount. So if you want to learn how to eat in the right amount, if you want guidance with your workouts, with your nutrition, if you want to build back muscle, you want to see results that last a lifetime that blow away you, your, your, you know, your friends, your family, you're sick and tired of being on this dieting train. You want sustainability. Okay, what I'm going to do, because obviously how many of you are still here? Okay. All of you that started here are still here. That means that this is really freaking important to you. And I, I'm so proud of you for that. So I, it only makes sense for me to reward you with a free strategy call. And what that means is I will literally map out your own free game plan talk to you, particularly you about with your schedule and your life and your family and everything of the stressors that you're going through, what you can manage, what you should do step-by-step. Step. And then that way, at the end of the call, you'll know exactly what you need to do, whether or not you decide to move into our midlife muscle matrix workout program or our fit mom formula program, the two programs based on kind of demographic age and where you're at. But if all things make sense for you, then, and we connect together, we actually connect then I give you that opportunity and we can talk about options from there. We have programs that meet most people's budgets and aspects of the investment because it is an investment in yourself so that you don't need to follow another program ever again. It kind of comes down to where you're at right now versus where you want to be in the timeline that I think it'll take for you to reach your goal. And I think that what matters most for the strategy call is literally just, let's just focus on giving you the free game plan. And then wherever we go from there, we go from there. You have nothing to lose. And I'm here to serve you first. And then because me not giving you an opportunity to work with me, if I feel that I can help you again, if I feel that I can help you is like me not giving you that opportunity is me not helping you to the fullest. The only way that I can truly help you is on a daily basis, giving you actual support and accountability and guidance with your nutrition, with your workouts, with this community. And like, yeah, so I want to give that to you. So everybody gets a free strategy call. If you showed up to the zoom call today, I'm going to leave the zoom link in the chat box right now for you guys to be able to book that. It takes two seconds. Freedom Fitness, Nutrition, Coaching.com slash strategy call. And there's the link. Go to the chat box. I'm literally going to give you guys the opportunity to book your call for free until tonight at time is it 8, 9, 10. So it's 10 o'clock for you guys now. It's been like two hours until midnight. So I'll give you guys two hours to be able to quickly take 10 seconds to book in a time that would work best for you. There's only limited time slots, so I would recommend doing it sooner than later so that you don't miss the best times and then you can't take the call. Um, we only have, there's nine of you, but we only have four spots right now in our program. So the sooner you do it, the better. Um, again, this isn't for everyone. So not everybody is going to be able to get into the program, but again, everyone gets their own free game plan and you have nothing to lose. So again, if you showed up this far into the call and you're still here, clearly this is important to you and I want you to listen to your intuition. So ladies, thank you so much for coming in, putting your faith and trust into me. And um, seriously, like it's a blessing to have your ears, your eyes, um, and just your attention. So I'm going to take a little Q&A. Um, any questions that you have about what